Hi everyone, welcome back to our uh, to our lecture series, Monty lecture series. Uh, last year we did the, our part on on imaging, and as per many requests and some of the fellow requests, some of the attending requests, we decided to to expand it this year to clinical cardiology and prevention as well. So it's a great pleasure today to have uh, Dr. Salim Birani, uh, who I personally admire. Uh, for his productivity, for his work, for his mentorship, and I've had the, I've been lucky enough to work with him uh, recently in some manuscripts. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Virani is a tenor professor of the sections of cardiology and cardiovascular research at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. He is an investigator in health policy, quality, and informatics program at the Ma Michael DeBakey VA Health Services. Uh, his uh, clinical practice uh, includes working as a preventive cardiologist with an emphasis in management of complex dyslipidemias. If you've been reading about lipids, I'm sure you've read his, his papers or reviews in the past. He also serves as a director of the Cardiovascular Disease Fellowship at Baylor. He's originally from Pakistan, where he earned his degree. He did internal medicine in Miami and then his cardiology fellowship and a PhD at Baylor, his PhD was in non-HDL cholesterol as a metric of a good quality of care. And in this topic, most of his research has centered. His research portfolio aims to understand the pathophysiology, epidemiology of atherosclerosis with a special emphasis on South Asians. He studied several domains in the delivery of high quality guideline concordant primary and secondary cardiovascular disease preventive care. He has an impressive CV with over 600 peer review publications and book chapters. He's had publications in journals like Circulation, European Heart Journal, JAMA, JAMA Cardiology, JAC, and he has over 110,000 citations. He has been recognized as a world expert in cholesterol, and he's been at the top 0.01% scholars writing about cholesterol over 10 years, and also on the top 2%, the most cited scientists worldwide by PLOS Biology. He served as a faculty, offered over 50 online uh, programs over, he's been invited to speak all over the world. And he was a panel member for the 2018 AHAACC multi-society guideline on cholesterol management. That is a topic that he will be talking today. So thank you so much for joining us. A pleasure to have you. Thank you, Dr. Bustamante. And uh, thanks to everybody for, uh, for joining. Uh, I can talk about the 2018 uh, what we call the ACCHA multi-society cholesterol guideline. Uh, what I'll try to do is talk a little bit about what did the guideline say, what the various recommendations are, but importantly, uh, what is the, the thinking behind those recommendations? So with that, I'll, uh, I'll get started. Let's see if I can advance the slides. Okay, so these are my sources of research support. Uh, again, none of which are in conflict with what we are going to be talking about today. Now, uh, I think it would be unfair if I did not recognize, you know, all the members of the guideline writing committee. It's a very uh, involved effort. Some of you who've been part of those would know. Uh, so we had a uh, fabulous chair and vice chair, Dr. Grundy and uh, Dr. Neil Stone, and then you have all the other members of the panel there. It's a very long effort. I believe this effort was close to uh, 16, 18 months uh, that we spent on this guideline. The, the things that I would like to talk about, first we'll talk about primary prevention. So I'll talk about three primary prevention groups. First two are the very high risk primary prevention. Those are patients with LDL cholesterol 190 or higher. Second is patients with diabetes. Those are the two that, in my mind, I think of those as high-risk primary prevention. And if you don't have a patient who falls into these two categories, and we talk about the pure primary prevention where you do a 10-year risk calculation and then decide based on that as to how you want to pursue or proceed uh, taking care of the patient. I will talk about three concepts when you're doing risk assessment, why we calculate, how we calculate risk, how do we personalize that risk, to the patient sitting in front of us? And then how do we reclassify risk based on imaging uh, when there is some clinical uncertainty on part of the clinician or the patient in terms of taking the medication? And then I'll very quickly pivot and talk about secondary ACVD prevention. Uh, what are the major recommendations in the guidelines and what are the reasons behind it? And then 
again, spend maybe a slide or two talking about major areas of concordance and discordance for the 2019 ESC, uh, EAS, uh, European Society of Cardiology, European Atherosclerosis Society, dyslipidemia guidelines. Now, my job in, in all of this is to make sure that we uh, improve our understanding of what these guidelines mean. So I'm going to refer back to two figures over and over again, one for primary prevention, one for secondary prevention. And if you are able to follow along that particular figure, for one for primary, one for secondary, you're probably going to be able to actually take care of good 70, 80% of the clinical conditions that you will encounter where you need to make decisions related to lipids and risk assessment. Of course, there are always nuances, but most of the information is really in these two figures, and that's what I'm going to try to do. So this is the figure for primary prevention. On the upper right-hand corner of the slide, you see the two high-risk primary prevention groups, and one of those is the group, or the first one rather, is the group of patients with LDL cholesterols of 190 or higher. Now, whenever you see an LDL cholesterol level of 190 or higher, it should ring a bell. If you look at the mean LDL cholesterol levels of the US population, they're close to about 110 to 120, depending on which ethnic group you're looking at. And LDL cholesterol levels, as opposed to triglycerides, have a very small standard deviation. So when you go above 160, you're definitely in the first you know, top 20% or so of the distribution. Above 190, you're in the top 5% of the distribution. So generally speaking, you don't do any 10-year risk calculation in those patients. You treat them right away. That's one thing I would want you to remember out of this part of the presentation. You see LDL cholesterol 190 or higher, rule out secondary causes, severe hypothyroidism. So check a TSH, make sure the patient doesn't have nephrotic range proteinuria, send a urinalysis, they don't have obstructive liver disease, check uh, LFTs. But once you've ruled out these major secondary causes, treat them and treat their family as well, because a lot of these can be genetic, which I'll come to in a second. So why do I say this? So when we look at, this is a very large study where they looked at those who had FH-defining mutations and did not have FH-defining mutations, but had LDL cholesterols uh, above 190. What you will notice is that for patients who had FH-defining mutations, the risk of coronary artery disease was 17 times higher compared to those whose LDL cholesterol levels were less than 130, right? But if you did not have FH-defining mutations, still your risk was about five times higher. So even if you don't have FH-defining mutations, but your LDL cholesterol levels are 190 or higher, you have a fairly significant risk of having a CHD event. Odds ratio of five is what you would get with some very traditional classic risk factors, somebody who's smoking, even there you may not get to an odds ratio of five. So LDL cholesterol 190 or higher is a very, very important risk factor. Now you may ask that if you have an FH defining mutation, why is the risk almost three times higher compared to somebody with similar LDL cholesterol levels but not having FH defining mutations? It's basically area under the curve. When you have an FH defining mutation, it generally means that you had lifelong elevation of LDL cholesterol, and that's why for the same LDL cholesterol, the risk is much higher if you actually have one of those four FH-defining mutations. So just keep that in mind, but do not forget about those who have LDL cholesterol that are high, but do not have FH-defining mutations. If you were to look at the universe of patients who have LDL cholesterol 190 or higher, actually only two to 3% of them will have FH-defining mutations. Most of them will not, but it doesn't mean that you don't treat them aggressively. Treat them very, very aggressively. Again, another large study from one of the NHLBI cohorts. And what you will see here is that if you compare the 10-year event rates for ACVD events for a person who is 40 to 49, but has LDL cholesterol of 190 or higher, the event rates are the same in a man whose LDL is 190 or higher compared to somebody who's 60 to 69, but has LDL cholesterol levels less than 130. So what you're doing is that in a man, you have accelerated CHD by 10 to 20 years. Whatever you could gain by those years of life, you have basically lost it by having one very uncontrolled risk factors. And in women, you have accelerated that by 20 to 30 years. So just keep that in mind as you're looking at these patients. In these patients, do not do a 10-year risk calculation. Go ahead and treat these patients early on when you actually see them. And this is what I mentioned earlier. If you look at it, 
only 2% of these patients who have LDL cholesterol levels above 190 have an identifiable FH-defining mutation. But the risk remains high even if you don't have FH-defining mutations, although the risk is much higher when you have FH-defining mutations. And now, is it because they don't have a genetic disorders? Well, they may have a genetic disorder. It's just that maybe we are not aware of those FH mutations, or these could be what is more likely to be a polygenic hypercholesterolemia. And that is perhaps what's defining that phenotype of high LDL cholesterol. The next question you may ask me is, what is the evidence we have that treating these patients actually reduces cardiovascular events? The answer is there's no direct evidence where these patients are enrolled. It would be unethical at this point to enroll these patients. These are data from Waskops, a primary prevention trial, where patients were given low dose of statin, really prevastatin. But when you follow those patients who, for 20 years, and you look at the subset of those who had LDL cholesterol 190 or higher, up to 20 years, giving a low intensity statin therapy was associated with a reduction in CHD death, cardiovascular death, and all-cause mortality. So again, if I have to summarize this group in the guideline, 190 or higher, rule out secondary causes, which we talked about. Don't do a 10-year risk calculation. Start lifestyle and high-intensity statin therapy very early on. Don't wait for their first MI when they show up in your CCU and you see LDL cholesterol was 190, 195. And then be proactive. Do LDL cholesterol cascade screening in other family members as well, because this could be genetic. So those are the four or five things we should all as clinicians keep in mind when we're dealing with this particular phenotype. Now, the second high-risk group is patients with diabetes. Now, it goes without saying that patients with diabetes have high event rates. And now, does statin therapy lead to more benefit or less benefit in patients with diabetes? Well, depends on whether you're talking about absolute or relative risk, right? The classic teaching in, in, in lipids is that you reduce LDL cholesterol by one millimole, about 39 milligrams per deciliter, major vascular events go down by about 21%. It's the same for patients with or without diabetes, but for the same relative risk reduction, patients with diabetes derive more absolute risk reduction because their baseline event rates are higher. If I lead to a 20% event reduction in a population where the baseline event rate is 10%, I will reduce it in absolute terms by 2%. But if I take that population and make it a population where the baseline event rate is 20% rather than 10%, 20% relative risk reduction of 20 will be 4% absolute risk reduction. So I have doubled my absolute risk reduction. And that's with patients with diabetes. Their baseline event rates are higher. So for the same relative risk reduction that you get with statin therapy, you get more reduction in terms of absolute number of events. And that's why we treat them early on. The other thing we know is that not all patients with diabetes are created equal. Some patients with diabetes have higher event rates. So those who have long duration of diabetes, those who have end organ damage, nephropathy, retinopathy, neuropathy, those who have concomitant low ABI, we know that those patients with diabetes have much higher event rates compared to those without. So what the guidelines are saying is that at least a moderate intensity statin therapy for all patients with diabetes but if you have any of these diabetes-specific risk enhancers, long duration, end organ damage, low ABI with diabetes, then perhaps treat those patients with a high-intensity statin therapy since their baseline risk is much higher. So you really want to bring that down even further. So remember, we talked about two high-risk groups, LDL cholesterol 190 or higher, I gave you a few pointers there related to guidelines. Then we talked about patients with diabetes. If your patient does not fall into these two high-risk primary prevention groups, then we talk about basically pure primary prevention. If you have a patient between the ages of 40 to 75, LDL is less than 190, they're not a patient with diabetes, then you do a 10-year risk calculation, and that is recommended to be done using ACC AHA uh, risk calculator, which is derived from the pool cohort risk equations. As you can see, I'm using the word equations because these are really four equations, one for African-American males, one for African-American females, one for Caucasian males, and one for Caucasian females. So there are four risk equations. So they are race specific and they are sex specific as well. Remember what you're getting when you're doing this 10-year risk calculation is 10-year risk of non-fatal MI, coronary heart disease death, and fatal and non-fatal stroke. So remember you're getting 
basically atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, not just coronary heart disease, don't forget about stroke because that can be extremely important in some ethnic minorities and women. So you're getting a 10-year risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease when you're doing that risk calculation. This is important when you're talking to your patient. And then, as I mentioned earlier, this is not indented to be used in patients whose LDL cholesterol is above 119. Those patients, just go ahead and treat them early on. So when you do this 10-year risk calculation, you will have patients who will have low risk, low 10-year risk of having an atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Again, in those patients, you basically go ahead and do lifestyle modification. No further workup is needed in general. If you have patients who are high risk, nothing is going to change your thinking in those patients. Go ahead and treat them with lifestyle plus high intensity statin therapy, preferably because they're high risk. But when you are in this intermediate to borderline risk, that's where a lot of action needs to happen. And quite a few patients actually fall in these categories. Now let's talk about why you need to do a 10 year risk calculation. Well, a lot of times people say, well, I can think of the patient being high risk or low risk. Why do I need to do a 10 year risk calculation? Well, this is the reason. If you look at cholesterol lowering, or blood pressure lowering, right? Both of those guidelines now recommend a 10-year risk calculation with this cholesterol guideline or, or, or the blood pressure guideline from 2017. The reason being that for the same LDL cholesterol lowering, let's say that you gave somebody high intensity statin therapy and you're looking at reduction in major vascular events, you, what you will notice here is if you focus here on this uh, uh, part of the slide on the left-hand side, that for the same LDL cholesterol, the number of events you can prevent vary by about uh, 12 fold different, right? 10 versus 119 for a patient with high risk versus somebody who's low risk. So same amount of LDL cholesterol lowering. Remember the same concept that we talked about in patients with diabetes. So if you are giving statin therapy to a patient, I am pretty sure you would want to know whether you're dealing with this category where you will only prevent 10 events, right? or you're dealing with this category where you will prevent 120 events per thousand that you're treating. The same holds true for systolic blood pressure reduction and diastolic blood pressure reduction. Any preventive therapy, it matters what is the absolute risk of the patient. Absolute risk is the most important thing that you need to know. And that is what 10-year risk equations try to do for you. So that's first principle when you're talking about risk assessment. The second thing that you need to be aware of is that statin therapy works. These are three primary, pure primary prevention trials. I haven't included HOPE 3 trial here, but if you look at the extreme right-hand corner of the slide, which I have this uh, uh, box there, what you will notice is if you look at the estimated 10-year hard ACVD risk, in MEGA, it was 5%. In Jupiter, it was about 7.5%, right? So even at a 5% 10-year risk, statin therapy works. We know that it works even lower than 5%. It's just that you will need to treat a lot of patients, and that's an open debate, all right? It basically depends on whether the patient wants to take therapy for a long period of time, but we know that statin therapy works even in borderline risk patients. The reason I mention this to you is that if you and the patient are comfortable starting statin therapy, whether that's borderline risk or intermediate risk, well, there is no reason to withhold statin therapy, right? We know that even below 5%, it actually works. It's just that you need to treat a lot of patients. So it's a very personalized, individualized decision. And that is what you will see when I talk about the other aspects of the guidelines. So remember this fact, because sometimes people forget about it and, and then they basically overlook a lot of things. The third thing that you need to know about any risk stratification algorithm, it would be foolish to think that any risk stratification algorithm is perfect. Well, they work very well for the overall population, but in an individual patient, they may not work. Now here I have shown you data from uh, an epidemiologic study, which is MESA, along with another uh, health system cohort from Kaiser. And what you will see is that PCE, pool cohort risk equations, can overestimate risk, right? On the other hand, we also know that they can underestimate risk. In patients with HIV or rheumatoid arthritis, they're estimated risk is much lower than their observed risk, right? So again, no equation is perfect, whether that's for ACVD, heart failure, AFib, they all sometimes overestimate risk or sometimes they underestimate risk. Another aspect of this, this is the beautifully done study from Cleveland Clinic, whereby they basically looked at the patient's uh, 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 neighborhood uh, deprivation index 
that was able to basically predict events better than pool cohort risk equations. So what you notice is, especially in patients who are affluent, it works okay. But when you look at least affluent patients, patients who are socially and, and economically deprived in those patients, the pool cohort risk equation doesn't predict events as well as it does in affluent patients. So you can see that there are a lot of other variables that come into a patient's 10-year risk. So when you look at pool cohort risk equation overall at the broad population level, it has reasonable calibration, but then you will find those subsets of patients where it will overestimate risk. For example, patients who are highly engaged with the healthcare system, those coming from high socioeconomic strata, it will overestimate the risk. On the other hand, if you have a patient who comes from a lower socioeconomic status, patients with HIV, inflammatory diseases, I will also add South Asian patients. In those patients, it will underestimate the risk. And that has been shown in various studies. And some of those I presented to you. So it is extremely important that don't use a 10-year risk calculation as a black and white phenomenon, right? Individualize risk. Don't just do a 10-year risk calculation individualize that risk to the patient who's sitting in front of you. If you look at that patient, look at a few nuances, you will figure out whether I might be overestimating the risk or underestimating the risk. And that's why we have this concept of risk enhancers. Family history of premature ACVD. If somebody has a 10-year risk of 5.5%, they're 45 now, and their dad had an MI at the age of 47, well, family history is not part of 10-year risk calculation. You may want to start treating those patients early on. Borderline elevated LDL cholesterol, 160 to 189. Above 190, you'll treat them early anyways. 160 to 189, we know a lot of data from Dallas Heart Study and other studies that even in that borderline risk elevation, long-term risk may be very high for those patients. You may treat them early on, metabolic syndrome, chronic kidney diseases, chronic inflammatory diseases. For the first time, the gardens are talking about women-specific risk enhancers like preeclampsia, premature menopause, right? Then if you have elevated HSCRP, elevated lipoprotein little a, elevated ApoB, or a low ABI, asymptomatic low ABI, in those patients, one could start treating them early on because we have a very effective therapy available. So that's the concept of risk enhancer and individualizing, individualizing risk to the patient who's sitting in front of us. Now, if after all this, there is some uh, uncertainty, then the guidelines would say that coronary artery calcium is a very powerful marker of looking at risk. So this is data from the MESA study that I'm sure most of you are aware of. Again, this is looking at patients who are uh, intermediate risk, low risk, it doesn't matter whether your calcium score is zero or not in terms of withholding therapy, whether you're, and when you're above 20%, it doesn't matter. If you draw a line that 7.5% is a threshold where I will think about treating patients, then if your 10-year risk is 20%, even if your calcium score is zero, where your baseline risk is above that 7.5% threshold. Now, we can debate whether the 7.5% threshold is the correct threshold or not, but most patients will cross that. So don't do calcium score in high-risk patients. On the other hand, if you have intermediate risk patients, generally speaking, if your calcium score is zero, you're not crossing that 7.5% threshold, you could for the time being withhold statin therapy in such patients if you wanted to. So where are we now with the discussion we had right now? Low risk, lifestyle modification only, high risk patients, lifestyle and drug therapy. If you're in this borderline or intermediate risk, you could start therapy early on, as I talked about earlier, because we know that statin therapy works even in borderline or high risk, uh, intermediate risk patients. But if you're not sure, then you could do a calcium score. And if you are not sure whether the patient's real risk is really what you're calculating because they fall into one of those categories, or the patient is not sure about taking lifelong statin therapy for primary prevention, what is, what is known as clinical disutility of taking a statin therapy lifelong, in those patients, you could do a calcium score. If the calcium score is zero, you can withhold statin therapy for three to five years and reassess with a 10-year risk calculation and perhaps a repeat calcium score. If you're above 100 or above the 75th percentile, I think most people will agree that you should go ahead and treat those patients. Between 1 to 95 or 99 of calcium score or less than 75th percentile for age, sex, and race, in those patients, again, you can use your clinical judgment. Most people will say, if you have subclinical atherosclerosis, 
go ahead and treat those patients, but you can use your judgment as far as that is concerned. So if I have to summarize all of this primary prevention stuff in one slide, LDL 190 or higher, treat diabetes, 40 to 75 years old, treat at least with moderate. You have diabetes specific risk enhancers, treat them with high intensity statin therapy. If not, do a 10 year risk calculation, low risk, lifestyle remains a class one recommendation, go ahead and do lifestyle only. High risk patient, lifestyle plus statin, preferably a high intensity statin therapy. If you fall into borderline or intermediate risk group, in those patients, if you and the patient are on the same page, you could treat them, especially if they have these risk enhancers that we talked about. Now, even after these steps, you are not sure there is uncertainty. If decision is uncertain on your part or on the part of the patient to take a lifelong statin therapy, you could definitely measure calcium score, which will help you in this particular decision making. So the three steps here that are famously known as a CPR approach is calculate, 10-year risk, personalize it to the patient who's sitting in front of you by looking at risk enhancers, and if you need to, further reclassify risk using coronary artery calcium score, the so-called CPR approach. The way I see it is, do CPR now, so you don't have to do CPR later on. And again, for all of these, communicate with the patient. I think you need to understand what the patient is thinking because a lot of decisions you will make here if you need to go down further in terms of testing depends on where patient stands in terms of their uh, understanding of what their disease is and how amenable they are to starting statin therapy. Now we have 40 years worth of data. We know that the therapy is safe and extremely effective. If you and patient are in agreement, I don't think you need further workup. But if there is any uncertainty on your part or on the part of the patient, then there's definitely a lot of room for further risk stratification. So again, that's one slide on primary prevention. If you understand this, then I think you remember good 70, 80% of the concepts. I haven't talked about older adults or young adults. We can take those as questions perhaps. Let's talk a little bit about secondary ACVD prevention. I have put down the secondary ACVD prevention. I know as, as, as cardiology trainees, as cardiology attendings, we all say, yes, we know what ACVD is. The reason I put this down here is that it's not all related to the heart, right? CHD, stents, bypass surgery, history of MI, yes, that's part of it. But don't forget about your patients with stroke. Don't forget your patients' peripheral arterial disease. The reason I mentioned that is that study after study shows that patients with stroke or PAD who do not have concomitant ischemic heart disease are undertreated, right? But the risk we know of having an event is at least as high, if not higher, than patients with ischemic heart disease. So just remember that in the back of your mind that it's ACVD patients. It's not patients with ischemic heart disease only. So when you're looking at these patients, healthy lifestyle remains a class one recommendation. But then for the first time, the guidelines, even in secondary prevention, are dividing up your patients between those who are very high risk and those who are not very high risk, right? And you might ask the question that why is there a very high risk ACVD category? And I will spend a few minutes on that later on. But what we know is that statin therapy in secondary prevention works, right? I mean, it's not a debate anymore. It works. It lowers events in secondary prevention and it lowers events basically by intensity as well. Higher intensity, especially in secondary prevention, works. At the same time, what we know is that any subgroup you look at, patients in secondary prevention with diabetes, without diabetes, men, women, generally age as well, in secondary prevention, we have enough data, there's no heterogeneity of effect across these subgroups. So treat them aggressively as much as you can. So when you have a patient who's not very high risk, and again, I will describe for you what high risk is and why we have a high risk category. If a patient is really less than 75 years of age, use high intensity statin therapy, which is extremely, extremely important. If patient cannot tolerate high intensity statin therapy, then you use moderate intensity. And in some cases you could use azatamide, which is a 2B recommendation. But if the patient is about 75 years of age, there are two things you need to remember. Okay. Just because they hit their 75th birthday, it does not mean that you bring down the intensity of statin therapy if they're tolerating it just fine. And there's no reason to suspect limited life expectancy, dementia, or other competing illnesses, right? So you could continue high intensity statin therapy, especially in secondary prevention, in an older adult above the age of 75, if you think that that is what the patient needs, 
right? Or if you have some suspicion that high intensity statin therapy may not be well tolerated, there could be uh, medication interaction. In those patients, one could go with a moderate intensity statin therapy. On the other hand, we have this very high risk ACVD group. So the question then is that what do we do with that group? Well, high intensity statin therapy, just like not very high risk patients, remains a class one recommendation on those patients. That's the starting point for all the discussion. So let's make sure that we intensify therapy to high intensity statin therapy in those patients as much as we can. And most of you who are working in large data sets would know that even this remains a major gap right now. I mean, if you look at any healthcare system right now, about 80 to 85% of patients in secondary prevention are on statin therapy. And about in the best case scenario, you have 50 to 55% of the patients who are really uh, receiving high intensity statin therapy, except one ACS registry from Europe that I will talk about. But outside of that, the best healthcare systems right now are only doing 50% of the patients on high intensity statin therapy in those who have ACVD. So there's a lot of room for improvement, even with basic therapies like high intensity statin therapy. Of course, this is the group. The very high risk ACVD group is the one where we really will get the most benefit by using non-statin therapies. And the reason for that is that their baseline risk is high. So we're trying to target non-statin therapies in those patients in whom the baseline risk is high. And therefore, by targeting that risk, you are going to get the most bang for your buck by using non-statins in those very high-risk ACVD patients. So why do we have a very high-risk ACVD category? These are data from IMPROVE-IT trial, which most of you would be aware of. That was a trial where everybody was on moderate intensity statin therapy, and then patients received ezetimibe versus placebo. This was an ACS population. In the overall trial, there was a 2% absolute risk reduction, and the baseline event rates were in early 30s. So now if you look at these nine risk indicators, this is post hoc analysis from IMPROVE-IT, and these are very common indicators, age, hypertension, heart failure, diabetes, prior stroke, prior cabbage, PAD, low EGFR and smoking. These are very common things that you and I, when we're looking at patients, we are thinking about all of these things. If you had zero to one of these risk indicators in an ACS population, look at what were the event rates in simvastatin, which was the placebo arm here, and, and the versus simvastatin plus isatamide, right? Again, very low event rates, and there was almost no benefit of using isatamide in these patients, despite this being an ACS population. If you had two of these, the event rates were higher. But again, your absolute risk reduction was 2.2%, what an average participant in this trial received, which was about 2% absolute risk reduction. But look what happens when you have three or more of these risk markers. Look what happens to your event rates event rates are 40%. So 40% of these patients who have three or more of these risk markers have another event at about six to seven years of follow-up and improve it trial. But look at the absolute risk reduction. You get almost three times more absolute risk reduction than an average participant in this trial if you had three or more of these very common risk markers. If you had five or more of these risk markers, which would not be unusual, I'm sure you see those patients, these are not uncommon risk markers, then the event rates in the statin-only arm were close to 70%. So 70% of those patients had at least one vascular event at about six to seven years of follow-up. So the point I'm trying to make is that you can very easily identify, even in secondary prevention, who are the patients who actually are going to have an event in the next five to seven years. We do this calculation in our mind all the time. The guidelines are just putting it down in words, right? If you have a 60 year old lady who had a PCI eight years ago, otherwise has no risk factors doing well versus a 75 year old male who basically had an ACS, also has diabetes, had bypass 10 years ago, you understand the risk difference, right? So that's what the guidelines are telling you when you're looking at these patients. You take the same improve it trial, and you take patients who have polyvascular disease. So everybody had ACS, but if you had concomitant PAD or ischemic stroke history, look what happens to the event rates. It goes up from 33% to almost 50%. But not just that. What happens with the use of azatamide? If you didn't have polyvascular disease, your absolute risk reduction was small. But look what happens to your absolute risk reduction when you have polyvascular disease. 
you add diabetes to polyvascular disease, the event rates go up even higher. So does the absolute risk reduction. I mean, 9% absolute risk reduction, anybody would take it this day and age, right? You only need to treat 10 to 11 patients to prevent one major vascular event. So again, the point I'm trying to make is that even in secondary prevention, not all patients are created equal. There are some who will have very high risk of events, and there are some who will have lower risk of recurrent events. So we are better off intensifying therapy in those patients who are going to derive the most benefit by the use of non-statin therapies. If you look at PCSK9 inhibitor trials, they also enrich their population by using major and minor criteria. If you look at 4A trial, there were major criteria and minor criteria. And the reason that was done, although everybody was secondary prevention, was to enrich the trial with those patients who will have higher event rates. And then that's how that trial worked. Then we know that even in the other PCSK9 trial, right, the Odyssey Outcomes trial, we know that there are some subgroups that worked better in terms of receiving more absolute risk reduction. In 4A, we know patients who had recent MI, more than one MI, multi-vessel CAD, those with PAD, they derived more absolute risk reduction and they had baseline higher event rates, right? And then we know that those with LDL cholesterol more than or equal to 100 in Odyssey Outcomes trial derived more benefit. This is some of those examples, right? This is from 4A trial where we had patients with stable ASCVD enrolled in the PCSK9 inhibitor trial. If you look at the placebo arm, which was, of course, everybody was on statin therapy. So placebo is statin treated patients. You look at patients who had qualifying MI less than two years or more than two years when they got enrolled in this trial, you'll notice recent event, higher event rate. If you had two or more prior MIs, much higher event rates compared to one MI. If you had multi-vessel CAD, much higher event rate. But that's not the only part of the story. Look at the absolute risk reduction by the use of a PCSK9 inhibitor. Almost threefold higher when you have one of these high-risk features. So by using these criteria, we are not just identifying patients who have higher risk of major vascular events in the future. We are also identifying those patients who will derive the most benefit by using non-statin therapies. The same holds true for Odyssey outcomes, which was done with alirocuma, the other PCSK9 inhibitor done in the ACS population. But what we know is that if you look at patients with baseline LDL cholesterol levels of 100 or higher, these patients had almost threefold more absolute risk reduction, 3.4% compared to 1.6, which was the average for the entire trial and you look at your numbers needed to treat, they come down drastically when you have a patient with high baseline LDL cholesterol. And of course, they have higher event rates as well. And that's why you have a higher absolute risk reduction by giving that therapy to those high risk patients. So that's why the guidelines are now talking about a very high risk category. So you might ask, what is the definition of very high risk? So what guidelines are saying is that if we have two or more of these major ACVD events, a recent ACS, any MI outside of this ACS event, history of ischemic stroke, symptomatic PAD. If you have two or more of these, you're very high risk. Go ahead and treat those patients very aggressively. On the other hand, if you have one of these major ASCVD events and you have two or more of these high risk conditions, which again, we've talked about, age more than or equal to 65, heterozygous FH, prior bypass or PCI, diabetes, hypertension, CKD, smoking, persistently elevated LDL cholesterol, history of congestive heart failure. When you have these, if you have two or more of these along with one major ASCVD event, or you have two major ASCVD events, those would be the patients who will be considered very high risk based on this guideline. So if you have those patients, then again, high intensity statin therapy remains a class one recommendation as well as maximizing statin adherence, which I'll come to towards the end of the uh, talk. But then if the patients are not on high, uh, are, are, are on high intensity statin therapy, if the LDL cholesterol remains above 70, then ezetimibe can be initiated. And then if, if they have been started on ezetimibe and their LDL cholesterol levels above 70 or non-natal cholesterol level remains above 100, which was the criteria for PCSK9 trials, then use of PCSK9 inhibitors is recommended. Now you might ask why ezetimibe first? We can have a conversation on that. Sure, it was not a criteria that everybody be maximized on ezetimibe. When these trials were started, Improve It was not out, right? So only three to 5% of these patients were on ezetimibe, but it was not an exclusion either. 
what we know is, and so that's why the guidelines are saying a stepwise approach where you maximize ezetimibe first, on average, you get about 20% LDL cholesterol reduction with ezetimibe. If after that you need to, then you go towards injectables because you have much more, much longer safety data that you have available with ezetimibe compared to the use of these monoclonal antibodies. The other aspect of this is that if as a clinician, you want to go directly to a PCSK9 inhibitor after statin therapy, we have given you this box, you can go. But what we recommend as per the guideline is that we do a stepwise approach, which is what the European guidelines are also recommending, by the way. The other aspect of using ezetimibe is this is based on three studies that I'm aware of, one uh, done in a large uh, pharmaceutical data set, and then two that were done in the VA system, that when you maximize statin therapy and add ezetimibe, you can get anywhere from 60 to 80 percent of these patients. Their LDL cholesterols will drop way below 70 milligrams per deciliter. And then the added advantage of using a PCSK9 inhibitor is there, but the absolute risk reduction may be very minimal. And that's the reason that the guidance are saying that maximize your statin therapy and ezetimibe first before moving on towards the uh, uh, PCSK9 inhibitors. Now you may ask, what do we know about this very high risk category among secondary prevention patients? What proportion of the patients are actually uh, very high risk? I would say approximately 45 to 55%, depending on which healthcare system you're looking at. These are data that we had published from the VA healthcare system where about 43% of the patients were very high risk. You look at one of these very large data sets from market scan, there, about 55% of the patients were very high risk. I think most of the data I have seen, it falls between 45 to 55% of your patients. So approximately half of your patients are going to be very high risk. But look what happens. When you look at patients without very high risk versus very high risk, there is threefold higher risk of having an event, right? And that's exactly what you saw in the uh, PCSK9 inhibitor trials as well, right? But even among very high risk group, some of you who were paying attention would notice that if you get into the very high risk category because you have two or more major ACVD events versus if you get into the very high risk because risk category because you had one, one major ACVD event plus multiple risk factors, even there the risk is heterogeneous, right? Your risk is highest among those who have two or more major ACVD events. Some of them have polyvascular disease as well. And if you remember the bar graph I showed you earlier, those patients have higher event rates. And then if you look at post hoc data from these are data from Odyssey Outcomes Trial, right, which used aliroxumab in patients with ACS. You will notice that patients who are very high risk, almost three times higher event rates, right? And then the same thing holds true. If you look at absolute risk reduction, look at the absolute risk reduction in terms of major vascular events, almost three times higher in those patients who are very high risk compared to those who are non very high risk. And the same holds true for death as well. The mortality benefit that was seen. In, in Odyssey outcomes trial. So again, it can be a good barometer to assess which patients are going to derive the most benefit. Now, of course, there are a lot of similarities between uh, the European guidelines and the uh, US guidelines, but there are some areas of discordance as well. But there are a lot of similarities, and I think we should acknowledge those, doing risk calculation, managing uncontrolled risk factors like diabetes, high LDL cholesterol, all of those things understanding that risk enhancers are there when we are looking at a patient, that no risk calculation is perfect for use of pondry RT calcium. There are other similarities as well, as I mentioned earlier, that even in the European guidelines, it's a stepwise approach of adding ezetimibe first and then moving towards a PCSK9 inhibitor. The areas of difference are that they, of course, are using the European guidelines, are using 55 milligrams per deciliter as the, as the goal, for therapy in this very high risk category that they have, which actually includes primary and secondary combined. We can have a conversation on that. Uh, of course, the, the US guidelines took an approach because there's no data supporting that you use PCSK9 inhibitors and ezetimibe in patients who have imaging defined ACVD, whether they'll derive a benefit. And for that matter, if you have a 10 year risk more than 10% by score, which is of course much more, uh, 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 you know, mostly fatal events, right? Uh, do we have benefit? Do we have any, any evidence for that? Patients with severe CKD? We don't. So we took an approach of leaving it mostly for secondary prevention. The European guidelines have taken a more broader approach to very high risk category. And I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. This is a question of how much you want to stay close to the evidence. 
a lot of things here might make intuitive sense to all of you. So what I'll say is don't get into this argument of which guideline is good or bad, just follow something and follow it aggressively. Even if we were to able to get most of the patients who need to be on statins on statins, will prevent a lot of events. Let's not worry too much about non-statin therapy because we're still dealing with issues with, with, uh, with statin therapy use. The other thing I wanted to point out is this law of diminishing returns, right? I mean, if you draw, these are data from Fourier trial. If you draw a line at uh, 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 70 milligrams per deciliter, right? And you draw one at uh, 0.5 millimoles, about 20 milligrams per deciliter. Look at this y-axis right? I mean, there's very minimal benefits you derive. You do derive benefit. Lower the better is fine, but don't forget about your y-axis. So absolute risk reduction that you get when you go from 70 or 60 to 20 is there, but in terms of the overall magnitude, it might be small. So the approach that the U.S. guidelines have taken is that if you want to enrich this group with those where you will get the most bang for your buck, do it in very high risk category group, so your absolute risk reduction may be high. And again, that's a different way of looking at the same data. The other aspect of this is that if, if you look at secondary prevention patients, if you are going to be using 55 milligrams per deciliter, what kind of numbers you're looking at? So let's look at 70 plus. This is data from uh, the PROVIT, uh, which was a trial that came out when I was a medicine resident. This is comparing 40 milligrams of pravastatin to a torvastatin, 80 milligrams in ACS patients. If you only look at patients who received 80 milligrams of atorvastatin in a clinical trial, about 55% of your patients had LDL cholesterol levels above uh, uh, 70. If you draw a line at 50, 55, almost two thirds of your patients who are receiving high intensity statin therapy in a clinical trial setting are above that threshold. So you can understand how many patients you're going to need to start non-statin therapies. In real life, this might be higher because this is a clinical trial population, which is your best treated population, right? This is the registry I was talking about earlier. This is uh, Sweetheart. This is one of the highest use of high intensity statin therapy I have seen in any registry, by the way, 87%. But despite that, they only had 8% of those patients who basically had LDL cholesterol below 55, which would be the European target, right? If you make high intensity statin therapy use 100%, which I don't think is possible theoretically if we did that, then you will get 21% of the patients uh, below LDL cholesterol 55. If you used ezetimibe in two thirds of those patients, about 50% of your patients will get to LDL cholesterol below 55. If you use PCSK9 inhibitors in half of your population, almost 50% of those populations then you will get to 90% of your patients dropping LDL cholesterols below 55. The reason I put these numbers here for you is the number of patients you will need to treat with non-statin therapies. I'm not saying that's right or wrong. What I'm trying to tell you is understand as to how many patients will require two or three lipid loading therapies if you're going to try to uh, work with various thresholds. I wanted to close out with one domain of lipid lowering therapy that we all talk about, but we don't pay much attention to. And that's the area of statin adherence. We know that statin adherence drops to almost 50 to 60%, even in secondary prevention, when you look at patients four to five years after having an MI. And it's even lower in young patients in secondary prevention, right? You all have seen that. So what I'm trying to tell you is that don't just look at the intensity of statin therapy, look at adherence as well. You will be surprised to see how many of your patients are actually not taking the statin therapy that you've prescribed. And this data from, uh, uh, from UK, it beautifully puts this uh, uh, concept there. And what it shows is that if you draw a line here and you take untreated patients in secondary prevention, right? you will have the highest LDL cholesterol reduction from patients who are on high intensity and who are totally adherent right? by refill data. But look at the gradation here. If you have somebody on low intensity and non-adherent, they get some LDL cholesterol reduction, but not a whole lot. Look what happens when you have high intensity, but you're non-adherent, right? So you may have the patient on high intensity statin therapy. You may think the patient is deriving a benefit, Look at what happens to their LDL cholesterol and look what happens to their event rates as well. So what I'm trying to tell you is don't just look at the intensity, 
look at the adherence of your patient as well when you're looking at both primary and secondary prevention. So take home messages in secondary prevention, high intensity statin therapy plus heart healthy lifestyle remains the first step in secondary ACVD prevention. Of course, the 2018 ACC AHA guidelines identify a very high risk ACVD group among secondary prevention uh, uh, patients. These very high risk ACVD patients are really the ones who have the highest absolute event rate. And therefore, these are the patients who will derive the most absolute risk reduction from non-statin therapies. But remember, statin use and emphasis on statin adherence remains the first step before stepwise addition of ezetimibe or PCSK9 inhibitors in these very high-risk patients. So with that, I'll stop and uh, I'll take questions. Thank you so much, Salim. That was an amazing lecture and uh, I really, really, really enjoy it. And you show so many of the the problems we have despite the data and how to bring that data to, to our patients. And I think I, I'd like to start with a question that you kind of gave an introduction, but so what do we do with the younger patients and uh, these 40 year cutoff in lower socioeconomical, you know, groups or Southeast Asians or, or some, some groups that are high risk? How, how do we deal with that? So first of all, uh, I mean, thank you for, again for the opportunity uh, to, to basically be part of this discussion here. Uh, I mean, those of your fellows who are looking for you know, an area that they wanna get into, this is the area, right? How do we basically move the prevention needle from this so-called 40 year cutoff to more younger age groups? Because we know atherosclerosis starts very early on. How do we work with lifestyle and therapies in, in those young patients? So now the guidelines do talk about those young patients. Some of them are very easy. So I'll take those easy ones first. If you have a patient who has LDL above 190, treat you know whatever be their age. Generally, statins are approved by the age of eight to nine. So one could use those early on. Patients who have uncontrolled risk factors, severe metabolic syndrome or diabetes, especially type one diabetes that's been there for a few years, you may want to treat them early on. Outside of that, if patients have a lot of uh, uncontrolled risk factors, now from cardiac study, you have seen that data, uh, sometimes even in their mid-30s, depending on the number of risk factors, one could potentially pick up some calcium score that's there and, and as a marker of subclinical atro. So those would be the patients that we can talk about as far as the medication therapies are concerned. But I think the other aspect of this is taking the lifestyle therapies and, and, and moving from primary to primordial prevention. So rather than you know, somebody having a risk factor, which is what primary prevention would be, allowing them not to get their first event, why don't we work towards prevention of the risk factors itself, which would be primordial prevention? So why don't we work in these school-going kids, identify those kids who really are not you know, at the level where they need to be with metabolic syndrome, with, with other risk factors, and try to move the needle there. So I don't think we're there where we can do large population-based strategies and treat everybody. I think we'll have to identify highest of the high-risk group amongst these. That would be one strategy. Their diabetes, high LDL cholesterol, poor metabolic syndrome, high, you know, bad metabolic syndrome, family history, perhaps treat them, perhaps use imaging when you can. Of course, very young, you can't do calcium score. You're not going to pick up much and you're going to miss a lot. Maybe carotid IMT is a better marker there. But then moving the whole field from even focusing on risk factors and treating them in these young groups to actually primordial prevention where we're trying to have them not develop these risk factors. And the other aspect in the guidelines that you will see is the use of lifetime risk, right? That, that can be a very powerful discussion point with these patients to, uh, to, to talk about lifestyle therapies that look, your lifetime risk of having uh, you know, an MI or a stroke or dying from one is almost 80%. How can we bring that down by better lifestyle? So those are some, some early thoughts. Thank you, Salim. That, that was outstanding. Yeah, and we had a, a lecture by Valentin Fuster when he was commenting a lot of this uh, prevention in the younger people. So we have a few questions and please put your questions in, in the chat. So from Jay Chuo here from our faculty, is it time for an enhanced ASCVD risk calculator or wider use of coronary calcium score? There are many conditions which elevate risk, which may be missed in primary clinics and therefore patients who would benefit from statin don't get it. So uh, there is quite a bit of discussion on what to do with the 
with the risk calculator. I think we all know that it doesn't apply to most of our Hispanic population. It doesn't apply to Asians, South Asians, right? So uh, that's, of course, an ongoing area. Uh, what we need are large data sets that can inform us in terms of, you know, we can calibrate the, 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 the equation to those, those groups. We just don't have as much data available. UK Biobank has some now, so there's work happening there as well. Uh, as far as the other aspect is concerned, right? Calcium score or no calcium score in everyone. I think that approach, if you look at the data, the data will tell you that treat all approach, especially now that statins have been there for 40 years and they're generic. You can get a high intensity statin therapy for you know four, four dollars or less per month cost, right? Any approach where you treat all is much more cost effective than doing further risk stratification only and only if you are able to get generic medications, which are available in US, not available in a lot of low income countries, interestingly. But importantly, the equation only holds true if there is no disutility. And that's why I used that word when I was talking earlier. If patients are ready to take that medication, remember you're taking it in primary prevention, you're taking it for 20, 30 years. If the patient is agreeable in taking that, that strategy is just fine. But that's not always the case. In fact, quite a few times, patients want to have more information. And in those cases, I think the use of calcium score is a perfectly, perfectly reasonable strategy. So that's those are some thoughts I have on that. Yeah, and then just coming back to that from another question from Jay, uh, and on this uh, adherence problem that you're saying that we know maybe the calcium score, if you have plaque, could help in some of these patients. But he's saying also something related to what he said. What are your thoughts regarding polypill then which includes statins. Yeah, so I'm sure, uh, I don't know Dr. Booster came after ESC or not. I mean, there's of course a lot of work. The most recent one was a secure trial in second prevention where they showed that it improved adherence and it, it led to a reduction in cardiovascular events as well. I think it depends on what kind of context you're in. In US, we generally, you know, as a nation want to have control over each individual therapy rather than a polypill. But I personally, as somebody who works in low to middle income countries, I buy into the concept of polypill, that if that improves adherence, then it's worth it, especially when we know our adherence is really poor. I mean, I showed you some data for lipid lobing therapies, but well, we know the same equation holds true for antihypertensives as well, right? So I personally think that it's a great idea as long as you have titration becomes an issue, right? And some patients may not need one component of it versus the other as long as those things can be sorted out, which I am pretty sure is doable, then I think it's a, it's a good concept for a patient to take just one pill rather than multiple pills during the day. And, and if that improves adherence. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another question from Mike Pato that is uh, he's actually an author in some papers that we have together. Uh, do you see us moving beyond LDL cholesterol and CAC in primary prevention and using things like LP little a or LDL particle size? Very nice question. I'm glad we are talking about it. So LP little a is definitely, uh, you know, coming up. Uh, most of you are seeing probably a paper every week that's uh, coming out on LP little a. Just at the time of ESC, uh, European Atherosclerosis Society uh, had, had commissioned a consensus statement. I was part of it as well. So in European Heart Journal, we just came up with, uh, with a consensus statement uh, uh, just a few weeks ago. It's very detailed. I would say LP little a, Definitely, we know that it helps in risk stratification. You know, it's a genetic marker because 90% of the levels of LP little a are genetically determined by some SNPs uh, as well as the isoform size. Of course, there are some measurement issues as to how you measure LP little a. That's definitely coming out as an important marker. What we don't know is just targeting LP little a lowers ACVD events, and there we have the we have the Horizons trial that is ongoing right now where an antisense is being used and we'll see if that improves cardiovascular outcomes or not. The other thing about LP little a that those of you who are not in the field would, would need to know, there's a very large ethnic difference. You know, uh, African-Americans have the highest levels followed by South Asians and Caucasians and then East Asians and Hispanics have the lowest levels. So there's a huge uh, ethnic uh, uh, heterogeneity in terms of levels as well, which is fabulous in terms of uh, a discussion point. So I would say LP little a is coming out to be a very strong marker. LDL particle size, now that's where my PhD thesis with non asian cholesterol was. And I think it remains uh, very debatable. LDL cholesterol, when you compare LDL particle concentration, not particle size, uh, 
LDL particle concentration to LDL cholesterol, LDL particle concentration definitely uh, does better as a risk predictor, right? Question is that when you do the same experiment using non-HDL cholesterol, which is cholesterol content of all atherogenic lipoproteins, the data is a wash. In some cases, non-HDL cholesterol does better. In some cases, LDL particle concentration does better. So what I say usually is I am not going to take a, a, a side. What I will say is that if that helps you in working with your patient by showing them a number LDL particle concentration, then definitely use that, right? Especially in patients with diabetes, those with metabolic syndrome where particle concentration may be important. Now, I will caution you that if you look at both particle size and particle concentration, having a very small LDL particle size is just a marker of having a lot of particles. So when you put particle size and particle number in the same equation in, in two or three studies where this has been done, the particle size drops out and concentration remains significant. What it's telling you is that when you have small dense LDL, it's basically a marker of having a lot of particles, right? If you take two patients with LDL plus 130, one has small dense, one has large buoyant particles. Well, generally speaking, the one who has small dense LDL has a lot of particles. So it's a particle concentration that is, uh, that is the key here in terms of uh, the, the debate. But I think LDL particle, particle concentration is a good test if that helps you in the, in the decision making. If you don't have that, then again, non-HDL cholesterol is pretty good. And it's the same thing with ApoB as well, right? ApoB is a good marker of all atherogenic lipoproteins because each atherogenic lipoprotein has one ApoB uh, as the protein uh, on that particle. So you can do ApoB, you can do LDL particle concentration, or if you don't have access to those, then you can do non-HDL cholesterol, which is known as the poor man's ApoB. So, Yeah, I think here for us, the access to, to non-HDL, obviously, and to ApoB is a little bit easier than, than particle. But thank you very much. That was great. Uh, from Rob Osfeld, our director of uh, preventive cardiology, thank you for the outstanding talk. There is a there is small but vocal anti-statin group, particularly on social media. That is sadly true. Uh, of course, we need to discuss potential side effects and tailor therapy to each individual patient before us. Uh, how do you address this issue with patients who have been told by experts that statins are unproven or are, are dangerous? That's... Uh... It's a great uh, topic. I think I have written a couple of review articles on this, and every time you get to write one on on on, on this topic, it's it's uh, it's interesting. Uh, look, I think Doctor Google sometimes can do more harm than good. Uh, in fact, if you if you actually Google statin therapy now, uh, look at the first top ten hits, and you will understand what I'm talking about. I think what. What I do in those cases, I don't think I have, by the way, a, a, a magical wand that will be a solution here. What I usually do is I understand, it's the same issue you have with COVID vaccine as well, right? You give the information to the patient, respect the patient's views, and especially in primary prevention, these are things that you don't just have a one-time discussion. You give them that information. You tell them that, look, I want you to go to reliable sources. These are some of the sources. American College of Cardiology has a patient page. Mayo Clinic has a very nice patient page. Cleveland Clinic has one. I'm sure you, your, your institution may have one. Go to these respectable sites. These are the things that I want you to read. And then come back and let me take your questions. And then you try to do each one of those. I have seen that in those kinds of conversations lead to more patient acceptability than trying to argue with them. And I don't think most clinicians do. Most clinicians are, are, are understand this part. And generally that leads to some patients understanding that and, and having that conversation every time that, look, I believe we should talk about it. I'm going to leave the decision up to you, of course, at the end of the day. But these are some things I want you to think about and maybe read this site. And I think identifying those sites for patients sometimes uh, is, is probably a better approach. And, and then giving time. I think time provides a lot of wisdom to us and to our patients as well. Thank you. And I even tell to some of my patients that are pro, you know, reading data or watching things to watch this in YouTube. So uh, your talk hopefully will help on, on the topic as well. So one last question. Uh, what do you do with patients on high-intensity statins 
that develop diabetes, hyperglycemia on it, any diabetes risk difference between Crestor or Lipitor? So great question. Uh, you know, first time this was described uh, in the Jupiter trial, which was primary prevention, high intensity. And in Jupiter, what was found was, which was rosuvastatin, uh, 20 milligrams, which is high intensity by definition, that patients who received that, basically diabetes was brought forward by about six weeks or so. And those were patients who had metabolic syndrome to begin with. And then there were meta-analyses that came out. So it increases the risk by about 10%. Uh, but if you look at even that subset who develops diabetes while on statin therapy, vascular events go down. So at the end of the day, what do we care about, right? So what I do is if I'm starting high intensity statin therapy on somebody who has metabolic syndrome, I would have that conversation with you that we have data that shows that it may increase your risk of developing diabetes. Although major vascular events still come down, what's important for you is probably heart attack or stroke. So this is what we know. Uh, the other aspect of that is that understanding that lifestyle does not go away when we start statin therapy. So for these patients, it becomes even more important to have that conversation with them that, look, I want you to understand that for you, getting your 150 minutes per week of physical activity, not, I don't use the word exercise because even in the guidelines, you see that we've changed that word because exercise can be a little deflating. Talking about physical activity, talking about portion control, keeping an eye on the weight, those things become extremely, extremely important. So talking about those two things, that the net benefit is still there way in terms of uh, benefit for, for reduction of major vascular events, even if somebody develops a diabetes, develops diabetes while being on satin therapy, and then the importance of lifestyle. So those things are, are, are things that I would highlight. Thank you so much. I think I, I could speak about this with you the whole day, but we have to go to work. So <laughs> thank you so much. This was outstanding. And, you know, hope, hopefully we'll see you soon in New York or if not in Chicago for AHA. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. It was uh, great talking to all of you. Bye bye.